What influenced you to become involved in the movie industry? What I mean, to, to move to California from Louisiana, and you have a degree in business, and, and you moved here because you said that your wife needed to be in a warm, warm climate. climate. yes. But what took you to Hollywood? Oh, it was a funny thing. I was working at the post office, and a friend of mine named Dan Elam, he was already working as an extra, uh, Dick Powell had the same great theater. And they needed some war to some warrior type people to <laughs> perform. Six two or better under twenty five. And Dan told me he should go out to this interview. And they'll be out on Ratford, CBS, which was now CBS Studio Center. Uh so I went out and when I walked through the door in the, to the uh interview room, when I walked in, Dick Powell said, You're my chief. And I, I got that headset. So on. you had the physicality he yeah. was looking for. Right. So you were my chief. And uh, so I started working. And the real reason I went into Hollywood was the money. Because it was so it was so much different than the post office and the Hollywood pay scale. Because during the drums of Africa, uh, uh Lord Blockner and uh and Mary Harley. Mary Harley was the uh, social worker and Lord Blockner was a slave hunter. And one of, the, one of the potential slaves ran up a tree, and they said, uh, if, not, "If you don't come down, I, you're no good to me. I'm just going to shoot you." And so the director said, "We need somebody to follow out this tree." And all, all the other black guys looked around. Cause he had, he said, then he said, uh, "But the person falling out the tree, I'm going to pay you a hundred before you got dollars out. I was up the tree." Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been falling out of trees, I'm leave that free. Riding the limbs down, and the limb break, you come on down, you know. <laughs> And then at the time, see, as a general extra, you were making only $11.15 a day. Then he's going to give me $11.15 plus $100. Oh, yeah, I fall out the tree. And so the guy was out there digging up the dirt. That's what you're doing. He said, I'm digging up your soft spot to fall. That's a move, man, before he changed his mind. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. So I came on. I said, when you want me to come? He said, well, when the block my shoot, come on down. I said, okay. He shot, and I came on down because I, I picked out my fall limb where I was going to flip myself and land right there. You know. And so I hit it in the door and said, oh, that was a good fall, but I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, we got to do that again. I said, what? He said, don't worry. I said, every time you come down, I got to pay you a hunt. When he said hunt, I never got the dollar. I'll back up the tree. So I pulled out that tree six times that day. <clears throat> and they paid me that $600, $100 bills. And you had never, set, ever been paid that much in your life. Which I had never had that kind of money. I'm looking at this right here. <laughs> and they had called the screen extra skill and sagged. The screen actors go, they come across, there were six of us working on waiver, on the Taft Hall, on the Taft Hall. And they were told us that all six of these guys, you need to get them in the union because they are good character types. But the, the other guys wouldn't do what I was doing. And uh, they didn't have no jobs. See, but I had a job at the post office, so my $600 was a bonus. And so screen extra girl said, give us $187. That's $200, we'll give them a change. And screen actors, you know, I only had to pay half of that to join screen actors. Yes, pay that. I say, anybody else want to? Yeah. So I get home, I tell, tell her once, I say, I'm through working the post office. She <laughs> said, you crazy? That good paying job. I said, I am through working the post office. And this was in 1962. And so then the word got around, we did some more stunts on that show. Then the word got around, say, if you need a black stunt man, call Calvin Brown. Or they said, Cal Brown, call Cal Brown. He'll do it for you. So the word got around, and I started working on different shows. I was doubling it. Everybody didn't make no difference what size. They would dig a hole, <laughs> and I would fight out off in the hole. <laughs> and, uh, so if someone was shorter, shorter than you, you to just me, I'm down off a hole. hole. <laughs> I stayed squashed down and did that. Uh -huh. On a bad back, you said now, and you can't tell the difference anyway. So I did all of that. And then, unfortunately, and I did that from 62, and then the good thing started happening in 65. <laughs> I wonder what that was. <laughs> a called, thing called I Spy, a man called Bill Cosby. And, and how did you, how were you recruited I was for work, I Spy? I was working over on a show called Go My Pie, and uh, that was Sheldon Leonard's show. Sheldon came over one day and looked at me and said, uh, he knew my name and said, uh, Calvin, uh, do, you, do you do stunts? <laughs> and I say, yeah, I do stunts. He said, I just uh, got a show called I Spy, and I hired a guy named Bill Cosby, and you kind of look like him. 
Uh, do you know Bill Cosby? Nope, never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know him. But if you say I look like him, I can do his stunts. <laughs> he said, yeah, okay, uh, Chuck, come here a minute. Chuck Myers was the AD on Goma. He said, yeah, take uh, Calvin's voucher because he no longer work at Extra. He's a stunt man now for I spy. So pay him for the day, he's gone. Sheldon had enrolled me in judo school and karate school. It was paying me $100 for each school a day. I would go wow. to karate school at uh, 9.30. I would go to judo school probably at 6.30. And see family, $100 for judo, $100 for karate. And plus when the show started, I was still working. I was getting paid for the day. But were and, there black stunt people prior to you being hired by Sheldon Leonard? Were there s stunt people who were black working for any other no. television show or movie? or? No, I was no. the only stunt guy I started that I can... In 1962, uh, I really started off in the stunts. Prior to that, I started in the business in '58, was as, as an extra. That was, that was not even actors being hired to put in a position where they needed a stunt man. But in '58, you were an extra. Extra. But yeah. in '62, when you were falling out of the tree, I became a stunt you man. became a stunt man right. at that time. At that but you didn't time. have to be trained for that. You just did it based on your experience in Louisiana. Correct. But As, Sheldon was the first one to say, you need training. Yeah. Well, yeah. he not so much say I need training. He said that uh, well, I spy, the first first locale was Japan or to China. One of, I Hong Kong, which, I think. Uh, China. They were doing this, the Kung Fu stuff and uh, martial arts type fights. He knew I didn't have that knowledge. But the other one I explained to him that I, I can do the fights or... Uh, I'm athletic, I can do the falls, but they had a gym in Santa Monica named Paul Stater's Gym where they train, actually trained stunt guys. I was the only black person in, in the class because you had to learn the camera angles, what hand you could throw a punch with and which hand, where the camera's here and there. I went to that school for that, but the other athletic ability, ability I had that. But Sheldon, he took it and said, hey, you're going to be the stunt man for I Spy, so I want you to learn the basic stuff. Uh, judo and karate. Now, that karate class was very good. Now, I'm a mild, meek, humble person. But when they started teaching me that stuff, now all of a sudden, after I got good at it, I want to go to a club and want somebody to start a fight so I can show <laughs> what I can do, you know. And I've talked about that stuff. And I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to go out there and fight somebody using karate. And these people are using guns now. And so I went to Sheldon and I said, Sheldon, I think I have enough karate and judo to do the show. And he said, okay, you know, you're cutting off my, I said, hey, you can have your $200. I don't need it. I said, because it was changing me as a person. I said, now, I wanted to do what you needed for the show, and that's it. The Black Stunt Association started after I Spy had counseled. And I, the first job I went on in 1968, I broke my leg. Oh. Away from my spine. Doing a stunt called, on a movie called The Split. I was doubling Jim Brown. And I was laying over in the Beverly Glen Hospital. Madison Productions, who was doing Death Valley Days, called me and asked me, and said, Calvin, said, we know you can't do it, but do you have another guy that we could use as a stuntman, this is the scene. He has to swim out and rescue rescue a person and bring him back to shore. Wayne King, God bless his soul, Wayne King had been around me for years. He was all talking about how well he could swim. I know he could play basketball. He's on our basketball team. He could play basketball. So I said, okay, call Wayne King. That evening, about 6.30, my phone rang again. Production from Madison. Calvin, why in the world did you send us this guy? <laughs> he swam out there, and we had to go save him. <clears throat> he couldn't swim. He could swim, but he drank Olympia beer. Oh. He had too much beer by the time he got. <laughs> oh, no. Then I said, okay, I'm sorry. I said, the next person I recommend it will be of a person that I have seen do what you want done, and that I know that they're capable of doing the job. And so when I got out of the hospital, I called Eddie Smith. I said, Eddie, get the Buffalo Soldiers together. 
we're going to form a black suffrage association. Now, now these are, are members. The uh, Buffalo so Soldiers has a membership because, yes. of course, I know that they were active in the late 1800s. Yes, they have okay, a membership. So, they have okay, a membership all right, here. go yeah. ahead. I just want to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, they have a membership here. They, they are a group. They meet every week, and they re rehearse riding their horses and the marches and parades and stuff. I say, this is going to be something new for them, or this is going to be stunt work, not riding the horses during the fight scenes and everything else. I said, we could meet at, at this park, which is South Central Los Angeles. There's bleachers in the open park. I say, I would teach you guys the basic things about how to throw a punch, how to fall, when to roll, when you forget your routine, what you're supposed to do, and we can get this off the ground. When I started the Black Suffering Association after I got hurt in 68, uh, I trained women and men. And there so. wasn't an association that you could belong to prior to they the take. advent of your Black Stuntman's Association. I was trying to get into the Stuntman's Association at, at the event of I Spy, when I Spy was going on. They had no Blacks in the organization. They had a rule saying that you couldn't work extra within a year in order to be a member, which was thing that it was impossible for a Black not to work extra if he was in the business. There was a way that locked in the door. And so I never joined it. And so then after I Spy came on, and after the, the middle of the second year, the associate came on. They wanted that prestige, and we got a guy in our unit that's doing the I Spy show. And I told him, forget it. When I tried to get in, that would benefit me and you. It didn't happen. Now it's just to benefit you. No, I would not join your organization. And that show right now, it, had, it was a bun. When we went on hiatus, everybody was mad. You know, <laughs> now we can't see each other. You know, it was a fun show because with our Sheldon and also with the two stars, they didn't allow, allow any bickering on the show. If you couldn't get along with so and so, you, you, one of you had to go. And there was no fights, no arguments. There were disagreements, of course, but our, that was between the inter and stuff. But we all got along as a unit, and the, that's what made I Spy so, so popular, you know. And Mr. Lynn had also put up the crew and the actors in the best hotels oh, yes. oh. in every single country. Every single country. And all of us, I know that, that oftentimes I would travel with our children who were very, very little. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there wasn't a problem about bringing family members. Right. Yeah, he was quite a Yeah, he was quite near. He put us all the stuff in. <clears throat> I used to love him for it, but I, I reneged on every place you put me up. I would, I would go across the street to the other hotel. Because he would give you the money to pay. I said, oh, no. I got me a place I'm paying $25 for. It, and I got this $175 I'm putting in my pocket every day. <laughs> yeah, and then, yes. and then the Grand Hotel in, our, in, in, our, That's in, right. in, in Rome. That's right. I stayed across the street. <laughs> and me and Bill would ex exchange newspapers every day. I would, I would bring in my paper, and he would bring me his. Because they were two different papers. And they had very little English in it anyway. You know, you know. That was quite, quite a show. I, uh, we were in Aco, Mexico. Aco, Acapulco. Acapulco, yes. Mexico, yes. when we got canceled. Yes. We all had tickets to uh, Tangier in my pocket. NBC said, we cannot guarantee you 26 shows. We can only guarantee you 13 shows. Sheldon said, I can't afford to be in Tangier and be canceled while I'm over there. With my money going out to win it. So you have to give me 26. We was going to Bangkok, I'm sorry. Bangkok. Yeah, Bangkok, yes. Yeah, Bangkok. That's where we're going. He said, well, no, I can't go then. And he said, well, there's 13 shows or nothing. She said, so, okay, we got nothing. Came on to say what that sad news. I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, I never earned that kind of money for in my life, you know. And being around Bill, it was just, it was just a treat, you know. And Bob Cup, but I was Bill with Bob Cup after I was. He used to make me mad sometimes, though, because Bill had Camille with him, and Bob Cup had nobody. And he would always say, "Come on, Calvin, let's go hang out. <laughs> let's go to the club." You know? On the show, all of a sudden, I, we start the show, and I start getting really hit. 
you know. And so I went to Cosby. I said, man, you know, I'm getting hit off a, off a lot, you know, for these guys to be professional stunt people, you know. He said, Calvin, you got a job. They over here, guess what? So do what you got to do. You got a job. And I said, okay, thank you very much. I went to the cameraman and he fleet cut, south cut. I said, fleet, wherever Ellis and Scott go today, just follow him because you're going to have the dy <laughs> dynamic fight scene. I said, because if I get clipped today, <laughs> this is going to be it. And soon they said action. That's why I got hit me upside the head so hard. I said, bow, bow. And it was on. This was Bob Culp's double. No, it was just one of the other. Oh, hoodlum, just one of the other. One of the oh, hoodlums, okay. Fighting against Bob, yes. uh, there's Ellis and Scott and uh, Kelly yes. Robinson. It was one of the hoodlums. So he hit me, and I said, when I, I'd already told Bill what's going to happen. So when he hit me, I whooped that man all the way around the stage, threw him over the bar, and sure <laughs> got him back out like that. And, and when we got through, that was a, when I got through, that was a standing ovation. So they had never seen a good fight scene like that in their life. <laughs> I said, yes, because all of it, by that time, the stunt guy, I won't call his name, but the stunt guy crawled off behind the bar and said, God, <laughs> what happened? I said, man, I'm tired of getting hit. I'm not going to get hit anymore. You know? <laughs> and for the longest, when you get hit, I would get hit accidentally. They were almost ruining the shot. Oh, Calvin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because the word got around quick. You hit Calvin Brown, he's going to come back on you. He goes nuts. You know? And that was, you know, that was part of the prejudice. They... Because when they did the pilot of I Spy, they black and a white guy that double caused me. Yes, yeah. I want you yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. Because what was the common practice in Hollywood whenever there was a black actor, yeah. uh, what did the white stand-ins or extras or stunt people do? Yeah, the way they had a thing called blackface. If they needed a, a black guy to do a stunt, it was always a white man, but they put black stuff, black paint over his face and make him dark to look black like the black actor that didn't go on too much in television because there were no actors put in a position that they needed something man until know? i spy uh, until i on. spy because it I was spy, the first i spy you tell. i spy was a test for cosby and for me they were waiting for us to fall and we used to talk about it all the time i say we ain't falling How did you deal with that? The fact that you were, first of all, you had to recuperate for two years, and then yeah. after you recuperated from that, then you had a problem getting work. Right. So how did you deal with that? Because that certainly was a change. It was a change, you. and it, it changed me, and it led to devastation. I went in there and started doing things I wasn't supposed to do. Then I became a, a dope addict for five years. Because I, I said it's because of that. I guess you've got to have some reason to lie. Yes. You know, but uh, when I got into the dope thing, it was purely, or uh, it wasn't peer pressure. It was that uh, try this, it's not, it's not going to harm you. The biggest lie in the world. I tried. So to it really hurt you that much internally. Yeah, I was no, I had, it, yeah. And plus, I had no income coming in. You know? Yes. And uh, I, I went back. Even, to the even, even heading the Black Stuntmen's Association. I mean, getting work for others. There was no money for No money no, came no, in. I, wasn't, okay. I didn't work out okay. as an agent or anything. It was just uh, helping people out, you know. But I, they didn't go to work and come back and see a Calvin. Here's twenty dollars. Okay. They didn't get a job. No, that did not. That did not happen, you know. I, or the thing was, I went back to the post office, got my job there. But then, the difference in lifestyle, I think it had a, it had a major portion of my sickness. Part of my sickness. Yes. I was able to escape and yes. be somebody else because I definitely was somebody else with that stuff, you know. And I didn't worry about peer pressure. I didn't worry about money. I didn't worry about onesie. I didn't worry about nothing. You know, it's just get the thing. To sedate yourself. That's it. To make yourself feel that good was, for the moment. That was it, yeah. But how did you come out of that? I came out of it. Uh, I was working as a dough man in the dope house. For twenty dollars of a twenty dollar piece of dope, and by the morning when the morning got here, dope gone. And I still didn't got no money. And so one day I was asleep. I was my head was in the closet, my feet was outside, and a big cockroach crawled across my face. And I did that and I smashed him, and all the stuff came out like this, you know. And I looked at my hand, and I said, Lord God, this is not me. Please help me, get me out of this misery. 
And that night I said a real, real serious prayer. When I woke up the next morning, still in that closet, cocaine smoke going all over. All I want to do is get my bag and get out. Because the good Lord had relieved me of the cocaine addiction. Called my son, Russell, come get me. He said, Dad, I'm not coming over there. I said, Russell, I'm out of that. I'm through with this. I'm, so I'm sitting on the porch out there. And when he drove up, he looked at me and said, Dad, welcome home. And he hadn't called me Dad in a long time. Oh. I was always just pops. And then this, he saw the transformation that, that good Lord had given me. And I walked away from him and went to his apartment. I said, okay, Russ, I got to be here until Monday. Monday I'm going downtown to rehab. He said, well, Dad, I got to go to law. I got to go to uh, Tucson to play in the the uh, old timers basketball game against the current stars at uh, University of Arizona. I said, "Okay, that's okay. I'm I'm cool." He said, "Okay, there's some money upstairs in the in, in the drawer in the right hand side and a pink sock. There's some money in there. Okay, here's the keys to the Corvette." I said, "I don't need no keys. I'm not going anywhere." I said, "You got food in the icebox?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "That's all I want." And all my residuals was coming to his house. I used to call him from time to time to bring me $20. I didn't know it was my own money. But all my <laughs> residuals, he just had a, a list of what wanted to come in. And so during that weekend, one came in for $144. I went across the street to the grocery store, bought all the food that I had eaten out of his box, replaced it. Oh, he got that yes. money. The money, the rest of the money was laying on the coffee table. And he said, what's all that? I said, whatever you want to do with it. All I need is $10 going to rehab. I'm going to take $10 on that. So... I got to rehab and looked up and I said, excuse me, I have a father, but I got to tell this little lie. You had to say that you was an addict or an alcoholic in order to be admitted. I was none of that when I went in, but I wanted to find out what took me so long. Why was I so sick? I wanted to read everything about this stuff. And so I said, how long can I stay? He said, some people stay 90 days. I said, how long can I stay? He said, some people stay six months. How long can I stay, sir? He said, well, some people can stay a year. I said, that's the one I want. He said, you going to put yourself in there for a year? I said, yes. And so when I come out of here, I'm going to make sure I never have any inkling to going back to where I just came from. And so they let me stay nine months before they kicked me out. I went into the rehab. I came out in 1990. And since 1990, I have not touched a cigarette, any type of alcohol, or any type of drugs. How does the lack of action roles written for black actors and actresses impact black stunt people? Well, uh, it's impacting the black stunt people are very, very deep in their pockets right now because they are writing most of the action stuff out. They're not doing it. And though that action stuff that they're having in there, they're doing that computerized stuff now. And when they can get you out of a job and, and do it with that pencil and that little machine, you do not have a job. And uh, unfortunately, it's happened to the whole industry, not only blacks. I it's see. So it has affected all oh, stunt yeah, people. All stunt work. That very, the, oh. the stunt work now is getting very, very scarce. You have to have some other job or you have to have some other thing that you're going to do in Hollywood. Because the stunt band right now is not like it used to be. I see. Yeah. And what are you doing right now? Right now, I'm back working as an extra. I'm going to different shows, working as an extra. And I still got my sober living house. That's going. Yes. And uh, But my, my, my money comes from working in the business as an extra. Plus, I'm 69, retired, be 70 and for a couple more months. But all my retirement are kicking in. Thanks to I Spy, my SAG, SAG pension is very good. <laughs> and thanks for the Bill Cosby show, my after pension is very good. Do you, are you enjoying the extra work now? Yes. The work is an extra. It's name. quite different. It's not yes. like when we used to work out there. You know, it's, 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 it's good. You it's know? good, okay. It's good because I'm, I'm, I'm in the atmosphere I like to be in. Yes. You know? Yes. I'm still meeting different people every day, seeing different different actors, uh, different uh, coordinators, everything just is it's Hollywood. And, yes. and I, it got into my blood through since 1958. My background was extra stunt person. And say, for instance, if they 
wanted to go on location. They wanted to take me as an extra, take the stunt, other stunt players as a stunt player, and I refused to go. I said, no, if I'm a stunt man, I get the same treatment. Arthur Davis was doing the show for CBS Studio Center. I won't name the three producers on it, but they wanted me to go stand in for Ozzy and also do the stunt work. The stunt work was going to be probably intermittent, intermingling between the second week, then they'll skip two weeks and go into the third week. Me and they said, "Okay, we'll we'll hire you as a stand-in for him, and take you on location. We'll pay you to stand in right." And I say, "Are uh, you need a stunt double for us, right?" He said, "Yeah, okay. Then that's who you got to hire. You got to hire a stunt double." I said, "Now I am the only person that I know of." We'll make concessions, and we'll stand in for him for an extra fee per day. Because but you I'm, are a stuntman. But I am a stuntman, just like mm -hmm. the other stunt guys you're going and, and you taking. And they stay on that stuntman salary whether they work or not. And I said, I'm going to be in the same boat. And uh, so I said, yeah, Calvin, you, you really want to do that? I said, oh, I got to draw the line. I said, they take another stunt guy. I said, I, say, I work. Fortunately, I'm working. You know, I would love to do you, do, do you, but uh, they're not offering the right package. And if they come with the right package, I gladly go W. And he, and the last time I saw him, he came over and did the Cosby Show in New York. He said, yes. I remember you. Yes. Yeah, you refused to double me. I refused <laughs> to go stand in for you on the show. He said, he said that was the best move you ever made. Absolutely. So they he respected would understand you. They that. respected you for that too. They they didn't want to pay you, but they respected you for it. Will you like to describe another challenging stunt you did that I fortunately photographed? Remember, <laughs> you do it. I do remember. Do you know the studio took the pictures? Oh. Sheldon Leonard. Yeah. Yeah, and his team took those pictures. This, this stunt was really good. It was fun for me. I'm in this helicopter. We're doing a thing called, Okay, what it was called then? The, the movie Top Secret. Yeah, Top Secret. We yes. The movie called Top Secret. We were in Italy. And we were in Italy. Yeah. And, and Cosby, his character, he was up in his helicopter, but he had to jump out of the helicopter to a bus going down the street. Then from the bus jump down on the bad guy coming out of the bus after the helicopter went around in front of the bus and stopped it. So I speak no Italian. And this pilot had me up about 40 feet. He said, too, too high. So I called back down on the walk and talk. I said, someone in, in, in Italian, tell this man, I would tell him when I'm going to jump. I'm going to tell him to go down, down, then I'm going to pick this, the height to jump from. Oh, Dr. Cosby, Dr. Camille Cosby, she's a steel photographer. So she's shooting the pictures. And so the first time I jumped, I, I, I could almost step on the bus. I thought, this don't work. It's, it's not doing anything. So I said, well, we'll do it again. And so I said, okay, raise it up. Then I jumped 10 feet to the bus. The bus, I would always pick out a spot where the bus was not going around a corner to land. I'd already stripped the bus with sandpaper. So when I hit it, I was, I was stopped, wouldn't, wouldn't go into no skid. And so I did 10 feet, and I looked at it, and I said, wait a minute, you, you can give them 15. So I said, let's do it one more time. Let's take it up. And so we took it up by 15 feet. And everybody looking at me saying, okay. So I jumped out of the out of the helicopter onto the bus, down on the street on the bad guy. Come out there. First thing Dr. Cos Dr. Camille Cosby said, Calvin, you are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the wildest things I had ever seen. <laughs> But I said, but I did. I looked like your husband coming out. She said, "Yeah." I said, "That's the only important thing I had to do." That's right. Oh my goodness, I can I can remember that so yeah. clearly. That stuff. But there was one did. in there we cut out. He was, yeah, it was going around the curve, and he's supposed to get, get thrown down on those rocks, and the lever was on, and you couldn't see nothing like this. Oh no! And I looked down there and I said, "Who's going to do that?" <laughs> Not you. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I know Bill's not going to do it. So we got to rewrite hardly. something. 
And so one night I was just laying there and say, you haven't seen Cosby. You got to go see Cosby. So I looked in the paper and they're all, the whole, <laughs> he's at the Hilton Hotel yes, in Las in Vegas. Yes, in Las Vegas, yes. That's when I got on the plane. And drove to, and got to Las Vegas, got me a hotel room, not at the hills, I'm down, down, downtown. And at the show, I went up to see him. So I went to the box office there and I said, I need to get this note down to Bill Cosby. And she said, okay. So she took it down, took the note. And sometime later, she goes, she said, what's the problem? I said, where's Cosby? Well, did, he, did he get the note? She said, yeah. She said, you look like he going to come get you. I said, yeah, he come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> She said, well, but you, you're that close to him? I said, yes. She said, well, let me, let me call the restaurant. She called him. He answered the phone. I said, Bill, what's wrong with you? Come on up here and get me, man. He said, what do you want? I said, I don't want nothing just to see you. That's all I want to see you. I said, uh, he said, have you had dinner? He said, well, where your money? I said, in my pocket. He said, well, spend some money. I said, man, I wouldn't pay nothing to come and see you. You're crazy. Said, he said, well, have you eaten? I said, no. He said, well, go eat. By the time you get through eating, come back. The second show will be sold. And I said, somebody, the first show will be over. I said, somebody will get you. So I did all that and came back. And this tall lady, as soon as I stepped back in the hills, she said, you got to be Calvin Brown. Because I was shaved and, you know, and then they had a mustache. But you look just like me, cousin. So he waiting on you. So I go back in there. And here's three big old security guards sitting over here. And all people were there. So just open the door. He's sitting up like that cigar. And he looked up. Calvin, and then we ran and grabbed each other, you know. I said, okay, I can go now. He said, what? I said, I can go now. I said, oh, this is all I wanted to see. Oh, I wanted you to see that I'm, I'm no longer that drug addict that you heard of because everything you heard was true. Mm -hmm. Whatever you heard, just say, yeah, he did it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we won't have to go into all of that. He said, but now it's been three years since I touched even a cigarette. And, and he I was said, very I, happy about that. Yes. I said, now this was the time. I said, it's right to come see you because I know you. I know you don't want no drug addict coming in about nobody. He said, yeah, because I didn't know what you had on your mind, what, what you want me to finance, but I was going to say no. That people right here were going to help you if you was going to act crazy. He <laughs> said, all you want to do is come and renew our friendship. Then he called call you. Yes, he did. And, and that was nice. Yeah. That was very, said, very nice yeah. of all those years. Yeah.